for a very uh, extensive introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be in Korea again after far too long. Uh, and this, uh, this great workshop, and thank you to the organizers, uh, Jin Chan Kim, and of course to, to Bocho for uh, this fantastic event. Uh, I'm going to concentrate today on uh, some specific work on wet spinning of nanotube fibers, looking uh, at two different systems, one based on carbon, one based on an analogous inorganic uh, nanotube called the Mogolite. Uh, this is mainly the work of uh, two PhDs who are working at the moment, so maybe I'll have some interesting uh, input for them. Uh, the carbon system is a different spinning system it's based on uh, reduction, and the Mogolite is an analogous system which we'll see has a lot of similarities to the carbon uh, case, but also some uh, differences. <coughs> So first, uh, just a little bit of context uh, for, for the work. Uh, we're thinking about how we might use uh, nanomaterials to improve uh, structural composites, multifunctional composites. Uh, we can think about uh, incorporating our nanomaterials to address uh, or improve uh, conventional state of the art lightweight composite materials based on carbon fibers. So then we would need to address uh, matrix dominated failures in particular by incorporating uh, the nanomaterial in the matrix. And that might be for mechanical purposes, or it might be for uh, uh, multifunctional purposes. I don't have time to talk about it today, but we've done a lot of work uh, incorporating a high load of fractions of nanomaterials between carbon fibers uh, and improving compression performance and toughness, uh, and also incorporating nanomaterials uh, to introduce electrochemical energy storage capability into a structural material. Uh, the other strategy, which is more pertinent to this meeting, is uh, using new forms of nanotube directly as some kind of primary reinforcement, some kind of uh, multifunctional uh, system. And of course, we know lots about nanotube fibers, so I won't say uh, much on uh, this slide, particularly on the talks we've had today and yesterday, but maybe a chance to appreciate uh, some of the uh, and uh, this nice review. Uh, we've heard uh, lots about the uh, different possibilities of spinning, but all of the wet spinning we've talked about so far has made it be either built on Philippe Poulin's aqueous kind of system or on uh, Matteo's uh, acid spinning. And what I want to talk about is a different way to do wet spinning uh, using reduction uh, to introduce the charge. So in Matteo's case, you protonate the nanotubes, uh, you make them positively charged, they uh, geometry repel each other, they form a nice uh, dispersion, you get a liquid crystalline phase. Now, instead of introducing a positive charge by protonation, you introduce a negative charge by introducing electrons, you can get a similar sort of behavior. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, uh, this reductive approach to uh, dissolving nanotubes and removing the bundling uh, from the uh, system. And what you get when you introduce the charge is an interesting uh, polyelectrolyte solution. So you take your tubes, you add some charge, you add some electrons into the conduction band, and you can get a spontaneous solution of nanotube as anions, so I like to call them nanotubide. So you think of sodium chloride, where the chlorine is, a, is an anion here, the nanotube is an anion. Um, and uh, what you have is an a polyelectrolyte, uh, but it's a bit different from a classic polymer polyelectrolyte uh, because the charge is uh, continuously variable uh, along, the, along the backbone rather than being fixed by particular functional groups. And because you can have a variable amount of charge, you can also have a variable degree of reactivity depending on how many electrons you choose to add. The general approach is a very nice way for uh, dissolving material. Uh, you can avoid any damage to your nanotubes. Uh, and I think you can uh, scale it. We only go up to about a liter. Uh, but I don't think there's any reason why you can make larger quantities than no uh, sonication or intense uh, shear involved. We've uh, explored that extensively in various different contexts. Uh, you, can, you can take your solution and then uh, quench it out again and recover your nanotubes having changed their physical form. But you can also make use of these energetic electrons if you wish to carry out functionalization reactions. Uh, so you can graft on all sorts of different organic species, you can graft on polymers, you can add inorganic species, oxides and metals, and so on. Uh, I won't talk much about this today, but we, I will show you examples of grafting polymer on the surface, mainly by reacting with an alkyl halide, uh, which is a kind of metathesis reaction, and you produce uh, an alkaline uh, halide salt and your uh, grafted uh, nanotube as a product. If you want to do uh, assembly, uh, you can take your nanotubide and uh, convert it into different uh, structures. You can 
gel it to make an aerogel, you can uh, deposit it uh, as a film, uh, or of course you can make fibers. So today we're we'll just talking about uh, the fabrication of fibers. Um, but Mariana, there's a little bit of rum lurking in there. Okay, so the first time we tried to do uh, uh, spinning of these nanotube wide fibers was doing a kind of reactive coagulation spinning. So taking something like uh, Philip Poulin's slides, uh, rotating the bath, uh, which is very uh, gentle, uh, if not uh, enormously uh, scalable, but does allow you to, to make fibrous materials. And here we injected the nanotubide into a solution of polymer, in this case, a polyvinyl chloride. Uh, and so what you have is a sodium nanotubide, which reacts with this uh, polyvinyl chloride, forming sodium chloride as a byproduct and cross-linking between all of the different nanotubes forming a network which you can then pull out of your uh, uh, coagulation bath and collect as a composite fiber product. Uh, so you can make uh, real fibers a few tens of microns across, you know, they're knotable and so on. Uh, the mechanical properties are you know, mediocre, uh, but it does at least uh, form a, a useful fiber. And we tried with a range of different aspect ratios and found that as you increase the aspect ratio of your nanotubes, you increase the strength of failure and you increase the energy absorption, you increase the toughness. One question about why you might not have better properties is that this is quite a disordered network. Probably the nanotubes are not as aligned as in my little cartoon. And also the connections between the nanotubes are all different lengths. Uh, and so not uh, optimized as you begin to strain the fiber. Uh, in the next step uh, was some work by Ron Lee, who is uh, here. Uh, and when he was working in my group, he uh, developed these uh, polymer grafted fibers uh, using the same nanotube by chemistry, uh, but here, instead of grafting a sort of random network of the PVC, uh, grafting a polymer of well-defined length uh, onto the surface. So here you can choose the molecular weight of the grafted polymer, uh, and we looked at uh, 5 kilodaltons, 10 kilodaltons, 30 kilodaltons, 60 kilodaltons, uh, and found that uh, around 10 kilodaltons was about the optimum uh, for making uh, composite fibers in polyvinyl alcohol, and you can see that the degree of alignment was reasonably good, and the mechanical properties uh, were uh, reasonably good as well for a polymer fiber. Uh, and there was some electrical conductivity, but not so high, probably because we've got a uh, polymer grafted onto the surface of the nanotubes. What we've been looking at since then is trying to pure spin not composite fibers, but pure nanotube fibers, uh, so more directly analogous to the super acid uh, spinning that you're all familiar with. So here we've been making pneumatic uh, suspensions of nanotubide, uh, and here's here uh, uh, and optical uh, micrographs uh, of uh, nanotubide suspension. And just as you do with the acid system, you put it through a spinneret, you hope that the shear creates some alignment, and then you create a, a nice fiber afterwards. And uh, we're wrestling with all of the process variables that we've already been discussing during the meeting how to optimize the dough, the dissolution conditions, the concentrations, the purifications of the starting material, uh, how to choose your spinneret uh, type, your gauge length, any uh, taper, the, the extrusion rate, the choice of your coagulant system, take-up speeds, whether you're using a rotation bar like Philippe or using a continuous draw line, um, and how you should um, wash or process the fiber. So first up, uh, dissolving the, the nanotubide, the, Ideal uh, conditions uh, uh, depend on the material, but broadly speaking, you're trying to maximize the amount of charge density on the nanotube in order to maximize the coulombic propulsion between the tubes. But there's unfortunately a limit if you go too far, which you get charge condensation. So this is uh, an understood phenomenon, and Pellico wrote a, a paper about it about a decade ago, uh, but the uh, classic Manning model tells you that when you have too much linear charge density on the tube, the, or on any polyelectrolyte in general, if the charge is too close together, the repulsion between those charges means that the counter ion has to remain condensed on the surface, and then you don't get good dissolution anymore. So what we found is that the charging ratio of about uh, one sodium for every 10 carbons uh, is around optimum, uh, which is not too different to the charge ratio in the, in the super acid case. Uh, we often go a little bit higher concentration of charge in order to account for any adventitious uh, water that may get in. So this was all quite uh, uh, oxygen water sensitive. Uh, we work hard to keep everything dry 
uh, but uh, give yourselves a little safety margin. You can see that in the optimum range, you get uh, very few agglomerates present uh, in your spin model. We can then take a spin over and measure the rheology. Uh, that uh, can be a little bit tricky because you need to do it in the glove box. So this is a little homemade capillary rheometer uh, that we developed. And uh, here you see the uh, classic uh, shear thinning behavior of a rigid rod uh, solution. Uh, you can see that uh, as you increase the concentration of nanotubes, of course, the viscosity goes up. And probably the uh, shear thinning exponent goes up a little bit as well. And uh, that's useful to know, but of course has some implications for what might happen in the spinneret channel. Because if I have a cylindrical channel, I can predict what the velocity profile will be. And you can see that instead of being parabolic, of course, I'll get most of the slip of the walls. And I'll get very little shear in the middle of the channel. So I wouldn't expect much alignment in the middle of the channel. And we'll see that visualized uh, a little bit later on in the model I think. So once you've got your material, we, we tend to use a, a tapered uh, channel in order to improve the alignment as, it, uh, as we come out into the coagulation bath. We then have to choose the composition of the coagulation bath to uh, gel our nanotubite solution. We need to remove the charge somehow. And you can imagine taking the same solvent as we're using for the nanotubite, which is DMAC, and just allowing uh, moisture, atmospheric moisture, to come in and to coagulate the fiber. Uh, but it's a little bit too slow. Uh, so we deliberately add a, a, an agent which can remove the charge, which is ethanol, and we can adjust the strength of the coagulation bath by changing the, the fraction of ethanol in the DMAC. And you can see that uh, you can then stabilize spinning uh, at a range of different ejection rates. You can see the type of uh, fiber that's produced. Uh, you can uh, uh, see the kind of cross-section uh, which you get from maybe a slightly larger uh, spinneret diameter where you have um, some granulation on the surface of the fiber and a reasonable degree of alignment at least on the surface. Uh, here's a comparison of a couple of different uh, feedstocks. So the T is Tubal, Oxial, and uh, the ED is EDIPS, uh, 1.5. And uh, you can see some broadly similar behavior, but slightly better behavior from EDIPS. So the student uh, who just disappeared off the top, but Joseph Moore, uh, he then uh, went an extensive optimization regime. We had a little bit about this uh, yesterday as well, uh, exploring the parameter space, uh, in particular looking at coagulation time, extrusion uh, velocity, uh, and seeing what effect that had on the specific strength and specific uh, stiffness. You can see that he collected a lot of data, uh, but broadly speaking, uh, you want to go to a uh, higher extrusion uh, velocity in order to uh, improve the alignment, but you have to adjust the coagulation rate. So you need to have enough coagulating power that you get a handleable fiber that you can draw out of the bath. But if you uh, crosslink it too much in the gel state, you get uh, worse performance again. And we'll see, again, that more clearly in the immobilizer. So you can see that the, the properties here are uh, maybe uh, 0.7 uh, newton per tet, uh, reasonable uh, specific conductivity, uh, not as high as some of the fibers we've been talking about, but this is uh, not a, uh, a system that's been optimized since 2013. Um, so uh, it's a, a new kind of spinning uh, system in using a, a different kind of dissolved tube. So I think it's quite uh, interesting. Uh, since this is M and F, and we also talk about multifunctionality, then we also uh, describe the use of these nanotubite fibers for structural supercapacitors. So we've had a large program over the years looking at how to make structural composites that can also store electrochemical energy. Uh, and most of what we've done has been in, uh, uh, in laminated architectures. But it's also very interesting to think about fiber-based architectures uh, because you have intrinsically short ion diffusion distances. Uh, and you have very high conductivity along the fiber, and that combination gives you potentially very high power densities, which if you're trying to make a supercapacitor is exactly what you're after. Uh, and so we're looking for opportunities to combine uh, structural performance with uh, energy and power storage. And so this was a work by another student whose name is also just chopped off there, uh, Kalpana Vadas uh, and she uh, spun fibers uh, using similar chemistry and got uh, somewhat similar results, but she was mainly optimizing for electrical uh, conductivity. And you can see the trade-off she got between electrical conductivity and uh, tensile strength there. Uh, and the 
the, the system again is not quite as good as the as the super acid fiber yet, but uh, there's a lot of optimization uh, still to uh, do. She uh, though measured the capacitance of the nanotube uh, uh, fibers, and first of all, in an aqueous electrolyte, in fact, both in uh, acid, uh, sulfuric acid, and in a neutral sodium sulfate electrolyte, and you can see uh, that she gets quite a reasonable capacitance, around 50 farads per gram, and you can also get a sense that there's some trade-off uh, between the capacitance and the tensile strength and the Young's modulus. And that's uh, essentially uh, because as you pack the nanotubes closer together, you lose porosity and you lose uh, the space for the electrochemical double layer, and so you lose electrochemical double layer capacitance. There's no such uh, relationship in the specific strength or the specific modules. Just for a bit of context there, uh, we can compare to DEXMAP uh, fibers. So uh, here, are, here are some DEXMAP fibers we bought and the uh, measured uh, gravimetric capacitance here, which is an order of magnitude or more lower. So in this case, the fibers are dense, but there's no uh, access uh, for the electrolyte. And so actually the capacitance disappears. So you sort of have this trade-off between uh, how much porosity you want in order to get your multifunctionality. These are the CBs uh, relating to those aqueous fibers. You see a nice uh, square sort of uh, behavior. Uh, it begins to distort, but notice the rate at which it's beginning to distort is 10,000 millivolts per second. So these are extremely fast scan rates. Much, you know, maybe a hundred times higher than you might normally start to see these kind of uh, distortions. So that really indicates that you have extremely good transport, both of uh, the electrons along the, the fiber electrode and of the ions in and out of the fiber. Uh, and you can therefore get uh, high power densities from these systems. Uh, in the bottom, you see the capacitance behavior in an ionic liquid. So now this is with a much higher voltage range. Up here, we've just got one volt because we want to avoid the electrolysis of water. Uh, down here, we've now got getting to on the three volts, which is good from an uh, energy storage point of view because the energy goes with the voltage squared. And uh, you can now see a very different kind of CV pattern, where, which is a kind of butterfly shape, uh, which is also known to be uh, a sign of quantum capacitance. So this is now uh, seeing a capacitance, which is a combination of the ions accumulating at the double layer, but also the challenge of accumulating electrons in the material. And because the density of states in the nanotubes is relatively low near the Fermi level, as you don't more strongly move away from the Fermi level, you have a higher and higher density of states, and therefore more and more electrons, and therefore higher uh, capacitance. And you can see that clearly if you look at the total differential capacitance, uh, which is approximately the density of states for the material. And you can see here the, somewhere like the Dirac point and the, and the Wellington band and the induction band. Uh, I think one uh, showed some data similar to this uh, for the Bales previously. So you can then build these uh, fibers into, into fiber scale uh, capacitors, and uh, this is just the symmetric uh, electrochemical double layer system, and you see uh, nice uh, CB curves, reasonable charge uh, discharge behavior, and uh, very high uh, gravimetric uh, energy density and uh, power density uh, from these systems. So it's quite a nice uh, way to think about incorporating uh, energy storage into the structure. As I say, that's something that we've uh, been uh, looking at uh, in a variety of contexts. This was a project again with Juan in the EU where we made a, a boot lid for a, uh, for a Volvo. So this had laminated structural supercapacitors in it. And since then, we've made many different uh, demonstrators of supercapacitors uh, and looked at their application in many different sectors and calculated what performance would be needed uh, in air taxis, uh, in uh, internal fittings in aircraft, and so on. And you can, uh, there's a, we've written more than 30 papers. Uh, you can make just about read the website there, which is imperial slash structural power composites, uh, if you want to know more about that space. Right, so uh, now we'll move to the other uh, system, which is the Mobilite system. So this is an inorganic nanotube uh, based around an aluminosilicate, and the structure is shown here. Uh, you, you might just about make out the, uh, the different polyhedra that make up the wall. On the inside is silicon, and then in blue is the octahedron of the, uh, usually aluminium. You can see this as a double walled example, although single walled nanotubes are also known. The diameter here is about two nanometers for the inner one, uh, and the length is maybe hundreds of nanometers to microns. These uh, 
have a, a, a positive surface charge on them, uh, called the hydroxyl groups, and they are quite soluble in water, or very soluble in water, and in water they make nice uh, pneumatic uh, phases, or in fact a range of mesophases. phases, uh, but we're particularly interested in the pneumatic regime, which is where we'd be using them. Uh, and you can think of them as being analogous to the nano carbon nanotube system we've been looking at, again forming a mesophase, at similar kind of dimensions. Uh, you can think of, if, if, now, if carbon nanotubes are carbon fibers, then these may be a glass fibers, if you like. Uh, they uh, have slightly lower strength, still good, but lower strength. Uh, but they have some advantages, which is they're transparent. So you can do transmission optical microscopy. You can see what's going on using polarizing microscopy. Uh, they're also strongly X-ray scattering because they're very crystalline and they have higher atoms. Uh, sorry, higher uh, atomic weight atoms in them, so you get stronger scattering. And these ones in particular that we worked with were from uh, Erwin Pino, who's at the University of Paris, and he made double wall nanotubes, but he substituted all of the silicon for germanium in order to increase uh, the atomic number and therefore get even better X ray contrast uh, if you have uh, low concentration solutions. And he explored all of this phase behavior that is outlined here. Uh, here are some TEMs and uh, SEMs and, and AFMs, to give you a sense of what the structure is like, you can see uh, the individual nanotubes. Uh, a lot of this material is a little bit shorter than what we're using for the, for the carbon nanotubes. So the carbon nanotube fibers I showed you were mostly one to five microns in length. These are more like uh, two to four hundred nanometers. Uh, and they're quite a lot more rigid than a nanotube because of the uh, double wall character and also because of the thickness of each individual layer. So we've really got short, rigid rods, uh, which are very smooth-sided, got no, very few defects in them. So here now is the uh, rheology of the system. Uh, this is now comparing the rheology of the amogalite pneumatic phase to the nanotubide phase. Uh, you can see uh, a similar sort of shear thinning behavior, uh, but uh, a lower absolute viscosity. Uh, that lower viscosity is partly because uh, the volume fraction is a little bit uh, lower, uh, because the density of the immobilite is a little bit higher, but mainly due to the fact they have a lower aspect ratio. You might expect the viscosity to go in the teeth of the, of the length approximately, so uh, you, you see a slightly lower value there. Uh, but you still have this uh, tendency for shear thinning, which gives you a, a region in the middle of the of a cylindrical spinneret where there's no shear and more shear in the walls. And if you now look at transmission polarized optical microscopy, you can see more what's going on. Uh, you can see the material flowing, you can see a high degree of alignment at the edges of the, of the channel and very little alignment in the middle of the channel. That's due to the lack of shear in the middle. So to get around that problem, we use the uh, tape and spinnerets, and you can see now that the, the alignment, which is only at the walls initially, uh, becomes uh, spread across the whole of the material due to the accelerating flow. It's very important to have a tape and spinneret systems. Here now is a, a similar sort of transmission polarized image but with a, a porter wave plate inserted. So now you can see the orientation explicitly of the immobilite. So the yellow is with the immobilite uh, parallel to the channel and the blue is with the immobilite transverse to the channel. Uh, and you can see again the alignment just at the walls in the cylindrical region and the nice alignment in the tapered uh, spinneret. You can see if you just let it come out without any tension, uh, you lose all of the alignment due to some die swell. But if you apply some reasonable draw as you come out of the spinneret, you can keep all of the alignment in the fiber. So now you, uh, we made the first uh, pure binder-free immobilite fibers. Uh, so maybe these are analogous to our pure uh, carbon nanotube fibers. Uh, you see a similar sort of cross-section here. Uh, you can uh, see a high degree of alignment in the polarized optical mic microscope images, and you can also now see a nice X-ray diffraction pattern uh, due to the, the strong crystallinity, and you can get a P2 uh, of about 0.7 in these fibers. You can also measure the mechanical properties and see you know, modest performance, but remember the aspect ratio is very low. But the most striking thing here that surprised us was that it seemed that the modulus decreased with increasing uh, order parameter. So that seems a little bit counterintuitive if you're thinking about uh, normal carbon nanotube uh, fibers or if you're thinking about normal composites. But we think it arises because we have these very short, uh, rigid rods and 
really what you have is a kind of jammed network. So you can imagine if you align them, there's really nothing holding them next to each other. They're very smooth and they just slide over each other. And so you get a higher strength of failure, but not much load carrying capability. And if you misorientate them, you end up with a jammed network, uh, which can carry the load. The other thing that the Amogalite lets you do is study the process parameters in a little bit uh, more detail, because you can observe what's going on uh, by polarized uh, microscopy uh, during the various steps. And so uh, here, for example, is what happens when you do the washing. These are coagulated in water uh, with uh, uh, calcium chloride as the coagulant. And we have to remove the calcium chloride, because if you don't remove the calcium chloride, you end up with it trapped in your final fiber, and there it uh, attracts moisture uh, and um, leads to a fiber that doesn't fully densify. So uh, you can uh, then observe the washing behavior, and if you wash out the calcium chloride, you get a denser fiber with a higher degree of alignment. And if you're trying to work out how long you should wash for, you can watch the uh, whole washing process over time, and you can see uh, gradually, if you wait too long, that the fiber actually completely dissolves. So it gives you a chance to optimize your conditions. And you should also think about the competition that's going on during this washing process, which may be happening in other kinds of treatment that we've been talking about uh, in the last couple of days. And that is that there's a trade-off between the length of time in the solvent where the nanotubes relax and lose the alignment that came from the original spinning. You get a rotational diffusion of the individual nanotubes with scales like this. Uh, and how long you have to wait for diffusion of the material out of your fiber, uh, which uh, relates to your, your flow rate and the, and the length of your bath. And unfortunately, if you work out the time scales of these things, they're more or less on the same time scale. So it's difficult to completely separate uh, these processes. Probably the rotational relaxation is actually a little bit faster than the diffusional uh, removal. Um, so uh, you always lose a little bit of the alignment during that process. Uh, as the damage of your fiber goes down, the trade-off may get better. So in these fibers, uh, uh, getting the washing right is uh, quite important uh, for optimizing the performance. Uh, here uh, you see that as you have a longer washing time, you get a denser fiber, you get a higher packing density, but slightly perversely, uh, a slightly lower alignment due to the relaxation of the, of the fibers, the amount of the amogalite, uh, and nevertheless, you get uh, an increasing uh, tensile strength uh, and an increasing uh, tenacity, increasing modulus, uh, and so on, as you do that. So if we wanted to uh, understand this uh, behavior, one of the other features of immobilite is that you can change the strength of the interactions between the fibers just by changing the humidity. So as you uh, raise the humidity, you see uh, a lot of water uptake, and then you see a very different response. So where you uh, lubricate the interfaces, you see a very low uh, strength. And when you make the friction much higher, you see a higher strength. So this goes back to our model of this being about a sliding network of rigid rods. And you can also see a difference in the failure surface. So when sliding occurs, you get this kind of pull out uh, at, the, at the fracture surface. So I wonder if we could uh, uh, suppress this kind of behavior, and that's by cross-linking the uh, immobilite. And so we thought, well, if you think about alginates, you may know that you can cross-link alginates with calcium 2 plus ions. Um, what if we uh, think of our immobilite as a, as a positively charged polymer? Crosslink it with multivalent anions, uh, it turns out that you can make a gel of immobilite uh, as long as you use multivalent anions. Unfortunately, if you try to spin directly into a multivalent anion solution, uh, you don't have enough strength in the gel to handle the fiber. So, what we did was we spun uh, into calcium chloride, collected the fiber, and then treated the fiber with a crosslinking agent afterwards. So, maybe this is a little bit analogous to the kind of diazonium treatment uh, that we were uh, hearing about earlier. And uh, we thought that would be a great idea, but unfortunately you can see uh, in all cases the cross-linking here actually reduces the performance. So it seems that if we cross-link in the swollen state, uh, we end up trapping a poorly aligned uh, uh, system uh, which never densifies fully, and therefore you get less good performance. Instead, uh, you can think about uh, infiltrating a polymer solution. And so here we now make a dense composite fiber, and in this case you begin to see an improvement in mechanical 
performance as you fill in all the spaces and sure you get low transfer. And we switch from having a, just a jam network of rods to having something that is more like a conventional composite and it behaves in a similar way. And uh, just to finish up, things that's a uh, full uh, circle uh, back to uh, some work that uh, Wan Jun did, uh, where he made immobilite composite fibers, so dispersed the immobilite into water, combined it with polyvinyl alcohol solution in water, and spun nice polymer fibers. And you can see a nice x ray pattern there where the immobilite was highly aligned, but also the polyvinyl alcohol was highly aligned, and it seems to be templated in its crystallinity on the surface of the uh, hydroxy terminated. Uh, immobilite nanotubes. And if you look at the mechanical performance, you can see a kind of conventional composite response of increasing modulus and increasing strength uh, with increasing loading fraction up to the point at which uh, we saw macroscopic uh, agglomeration in the fiber at about uh, 14 volume percent uh, immobilite. Well, probably the most interesting thing was that there was a, a sense that you could have a healable uh, fiber. Uh, so uh, most self healing systems uh, operate very weak, soft gels. And here we have something which is essentially a structural uh, engineering polymer kind of level of performance uh, in the hundreds of megapascals. And you can break the fiber, bring the ends together, uh, add a little bit of water as a plasticizer, and recover a fair amount of the strength. So um, it seems that you need to have both the immobilite and the polymer present. The immobilite seems to form a framework which is robust and uh, which templates the re formation of the polymer and the recrystallization of the polymer in the break, and that's what gives you some recovery. So it's quite an initial piece of work, but it's interesting to think about the possibility of making something approaching a structural material with a degree of intrinsic self healing So that's all I was going to talk about today. I've shown you uh, pure composite immobilite and carbon nanotube fibers uh, for both uh, some structural performance and some multifunctional uh, behavior in both super caps and in self healing fibers. Uh, I hope you think that reductive uh, nanotubide uh, type chemistry is an interesting way maybe to spin fibers that might be complementary to the acid spinning. Uh, you can get conductive fibers, they're low bearing, uh, good electrochemical capacitance. And um, this immobilite system I think is very interesting for in situ uh, studies. Uh, and it might be very interesting to do in situ x ray studies, in fact, as well uh, in, in the future uh, in order to understand what's going on. So, uh, thanks to the uh, various uh, funding bodies and, of course, the people who did the work. And I think you can see uh, Wong Jun uh, Lee there, mm -hmm. a bit of an angle. And, uh, and also uh, Joe and Calvin, who actually did most of the work I showed you tonight. So thanks very much.